Hello everyone. Thank you for joining me around the fireside tonight. My name is Joe, and I'm here to tell you a story. A story about lions, scarecrows, and tin men. A story about brains, courage, and heart. A story about being far from home. A story about somewhere over the rainbow. Proudly presenting part one of The Wonderful Wizard of Oz, written by L. Frank Baum, originally published in 1900. Thank you to everyone who took part in our Facebook poll and helped decide that we should have this episode next. I sincerely hope you enjoy it. If you do, please let me know by leaving a rating or a comment or subscribing to the show on whatever platform you're listening on. Every interaction truly does mean the world to this channel. If you want to support Tales by the Fireside, the easiest way to do this is by going to buymeacoffee.com slash tbtf. Every donation goes back into running the show and really does mean the world to this channel. Every episode, every platform and other ways to support the show are on talesbythefireside.com. Now please, get comfortable let go of the daylight and join me for our story. The Wonderful Wizard of Oz by L. Frank Baum Introduction Folklore, legends, myths and fairy tales have followed childhood through the ages for every healthy youngster has a wholesome and instinctive love for stories fantastic, marvellous and manifestly unreal. The winged fairies of Grimm and Anderson have brought more happiness to childish hearts than all other human creations. Yet, the old-time fairy tale, having served for generations, may now be classed as historical in the children's library, for the time has come for a series of newer wonder tales in which the stereotype genie, dwarf and fairy are eliminated, together with the horrible and blood-curdling incidents devised by their authors to point a fearsome moral to each tale. Modern education includes morality, therefore the modern child seeks only entertainment in its wonder tales, and gladly dispenses with all disagreeable incident. Having this thought in mind, the story of The Wonderful Wizard of Oz was written solely to please children of today. It aspires to being a modernised fairy tale, in which the wonderment and joy are retained, and the heartaches and nightmares are left out. L. Frank Baum Chicago, April, 1900. The Wonderful Wizard of Oz. Chapter 1. The Cyclone. Dorothy lived in the midst of the great Kansas prairies, with Uncle Henry, who was a farmer, and Aunt Em, who was the farmer's wife. Their house was small, for the lumber to build it had to be carried by wagon many miles. There were four walls, a floor and a roof, which made one room, and this room contained a rusty-looking cook stove, a cupboard for the dishes, a table, three or four chairs and the beds. Uncle Henry and Aunt Em had a big bed in one corner, and Dorothy had a little bed in another corner. There was no garret at all, and no cellar, except a small hole dug in the ground, called a cyclone cellar, where the family could go in case one of those great whirlwinds arose, mighty enough to crush any building in its path. It was reached by a trap door in the middle of the floor, from which a ladder led down into the small, dark hole. When Dorothy stood in the doorway and looked around, 
she could see nothing but the great grey prairie on every side. Not a tree nor a house broke the broad sweep of flat country that reached to the edge of the sky in all directions. The sun had baked the ploughed land into a grey mass, with little cracks running through it. Even the grass was not green, for the sun had burned the tops of the long blades until they were the same grey colour to be seen everywhere. Once the house had been painted, but the sun blistered the paint and the rains washed it away, and now the house was as dull and grey as everything else. When Aunt Em came there to live, she was a young, pretty wife. The sun and wind had changed her too. They had taken the sparkle from her eyes and left them a sober grey. They had taken the red from her cheeks and lips, and they were grey also. She was thin and gaunt, and never smiled now. When Dorothy, who was an orphan, first came to her, Aunt Em had been so startled by the child's laughter that she would scream and press her hand upon her heart whenever Dorothy's merry voice reached her ears. And she still looked at the little girl with wonder that she could find anything to laugh at. Uncle Henry never laughed. He worked hard from morning till night and did not know what joy was. He was grey also from his long beard to his rough boots, and he looked stern and solemn, and rarely spoke. It was Toto that made Dorothy laugh, and saved her from growing as grey as her other surroundings. Toto was not grey, he was a little black dog, with long silky hair and small black eyes that twinkled merrily on either side of his funny wee nose. Toto played all day long, and Dorothy played with him and loved him dearly. Today, however, they were not playing. Uncle Henry sat upon the doorstep and looked anxiously at the sky, which was even greyer than usual. Dorothy stood in the door with Toto in her arms and looked at the sky too. Aunt Em was washing the dishes. From the far north they heard a low wail of the wind and Uncle Henry and Dorothy could see where the long grass bowed in waves before the coming storm. There now came a sharp whistling in the air from the south, and as they turned their eyes that way, they saw ripples in the grass coming from that direction also. Suddenly, Uncle Henry stood up. There's a cyclone coming, Em, he called to his wife. I'll go look after the stock. Then he ran towards the sheds where the cows and horses were kept. Aunt Em dropped her work and came to the door. One glance told her of the danger close at hand. Quick, Dorothy, she screamed. Run for the cellar. Toto jumped out of Dorothy's arms and hid under the bed, and the girl started to get him. Aunt Em, badly frightened, threw open the trap door in the floor and climbed down the ladder into the small, dark hole. Dorothy caught Toto at last and started to follow her aunt. When she was halfway across the room, there came a great shriek from the wind, and the house shook so hard that she lost her footing and sat down suddenly upon the floor. Then a strange thing happened. The house whirled around two or three times and rose slowly through the air. Dorothy felt as if she were going up in a balloon. The north and south winds met where the house stood, and made it the exact centre of the cyclone. In the middle of a cyclone, the air is generally still, but the great pressure of the wind on every side of the house raised it up higher and higher, until it was at the very top of the cyclone. And there it remained, and was carried miles and miles away, as easily as you could carry a feather. It was very dark, and the wind howled horribly around her, but Dorothy found she was riding quite easily. After the first few whirls around, and one other time when the house tipped badly, she felt as if she were being rocked gently, like a baby in a cradle. 
Toto did not like it. He ran about the room, now here, now there, barking loudly. But Dorothy sat quite still on the floor and waited to see what would happen. Once Toto got too near the open trap door and fell in, and at first the little girl thought she'd lost him. But soon she saw one of his ears sticking up through the hole, for the strong pressure of the air was keeping him up so that he could not fall. She crept to the hole, caught Toto by the ear, and dragged him into the room again, afterward closing the trap door so that no more accidents could happen. Hour after hour passed away, and slowly Dorothy got over her fright. But she felt quite lonely, and the wind shrieked so loudly all about her that she became nearly deaf. At first, she had wondered if she would be dashed to pieces when the house fell again. But as the hours passed and nothing terrible happened, she stopped worrying and resolved to wait calmly and see what the future would bring. At last, she crawled over the swaying floor to her bed and lay down upon it. Toto followed and laid down beside her. In spite of the swaying of the house and the wailing of the wind, Dorothy soon closed her eyes and fell asleep. Chapter 2 The Council with the Munchkins She was awakened by a shock, so sudden and severe that if Dorothy had not been lying on the soft bed, she might have been hurt. As it was, the jar made her catch her breath and wonder what had happened and Toto put his cold little nose into her face and whined dismally. Dorothy sat up and noticed that the house was not moving, nor was it dark, for the bright sunshine came in at the window, flooding the little room. She sprang from her bed, and with Toto at her heels, ran and opened the door. The little girl gave a cry of amazement and looked around her, her eyes growing bigger and bigger at the wonderful sight she saw. The cyclone had set the house down very gently, for a cyclone, in the midst of a country of marvellous beauty. There were lovely patches of greenswood all about, with stately trees bearing rich and luscious fruits. Banks of gorgeous flowers were on every hand, and birds with rare and brilliant plumage sang and fluttered in the trees and bushes. A little way off was a small brook, rushing and sparkling along the green banks, and murmuring in a voice very grateful to a little girl who had lived so long on the dry, grey prairies. While she stood looking eagerly at the strange and beautiful sights, she noticed coming toward her, a group of the strangest people she'd ever seen. They were not as big as the grown folk she had always been used to, but neither were they very small. In fact, they seemed about as tall as Dorothy, who was a well-grown child for her age, although they were, so far as looks go, many years older. Three were men and one a woman, and all were oddly dressed. They wore round hats that rose to a small point a foot above their heads, with little bells and the brims that tinkled sweetly as they moved. The hats of the men were blue, the little woman's hat was white, and she wore a white gown that hung in plaits from her shoulders. Over it were sprinkled little stars that glistened in the sun like diamonds. The men were dressed in blue, of the same shade as their hats, and wore well-polished boots, with a deep roll of blue at the tops. The men, Dorothy thought, were about as old as Uncle Henry, for two of them had beards, but the little woman was doubtless much older. Her face was covered with wrinkles, her hair was nearly white, and she walked rather stiffly. When these people drew near the house where Dorothy was standing in the doorway, they paused and whispered among themselves, as if afraid to come farther. But the little old woman walked up to Dorothy, made a low bow, and said in a sweet voice, 
you are welcome, most noble sorceress, to the land of the Munchkins. We are so grateful to you for having killed the Wicked Witch of the East and for setting our people free from bondage. Dorothy listened to this speech with wonder. What could the little woman possibly mean by calling her a sorceress and saying she had killed the Wicked Witch of the East? Dorothy was an innocent, harmless little girl who had been carried by a cyclone many miles from home and she had never killed anything in all her life. But the little woman evidently expected her to answer. So Dorothy said with hesitation, You are very kind, but there must be some mistake. I have not killed anything. Your house did anyway, replied the little old woman with a laugh. And that is the same thing. See, she continued, pointing to the corner of the house. There are her two feet, still sticking out from under a block of wood. Dorothy looked and gave a little cry of fright. And there indeed, just under the corner of the great beam the house rested on, two feet were sticking out, shod in silver shoes with pointed toes. Oh dear, oh dear, cried Dorothy clasping her hands together in dismay. The house must have fallen on her. Whatever shall we do? There is nothing to be done, said the little woman calmly. But who was she? asked Dorothy. She was the Wicked Witch of the East, as I said, answered the little woman. She has held all the munchkins in bondage for many years, making them slay for her night and day. Now they are all set free and are grateful to you for the favour. Who are the munchkins? inquired Dorothy. They are the people who live in this land of the east where the wicked witch ruled. Are you a munchkin? asked Dorothy. No, but I am their friend, although I live in the land of the north. When they saw the witch of the east was dead, the munchkin sent a swift messenger to me, and I came at once. I am the witch of the north. Oh gracious, cried Dorothy, are you a real witch? Yes, indeed, answered the little woman, but I am a good witch and the people love me. I am not as powerful as the wicked witch who ruled here, or I should have set the people free myself. But I thought all the witches were wicked, said the girl, who was half frightened at facing a real witch. Oh no, that is a great mistake. There are only four witches in all the land of Oz. And two of them, those who live in the north and south, are good witches. I know this is true, for I am one of them myself and cannot be mistaken. Those who dwelt in the east and west were, indeed, wicked witches. But now you've killed one of them. There is but one wicked witch in all the land of Oz. The one who lives in the west. But, Dorothy said, after a moment's thought, Aunt Em has told me that all the witches were dead. Years and years ago. Who is Aunt Em? inquired the little old woman. She is my aunt who lives in Kansas, where I come from. The Witch of the North seemed to think for a time, with her head bowed and her eyes upon the ground. Then she looked up and said, I do not know where Kansas is, for I have never heard of that country mentioned before. But tell me, is it a civilised country? Oh yes, replied Dorothy. Then that accounts for it. In the civilised countries, I believe there are no witches left. Nor wizards, nor sorceresses, nor magicians. But you see, the land of Oz has never been civilised, for we are cut off from all the rest of the world. Therefore, we still have witches and wizards amongst us. Who are the wizards? asked Dorothy. Oz himself is the great wizard, answered the witch, sinking her voice to a whisper. He is more powerful than all the rest of us together. He lives in the City of Emeralds. Dorothy was going to ask another question, but just then the Munchkins, who had been standing silently by, gave a loud shout and pointed to the corner of the house where the Wicked Witch had been lying. What is it? asked the little old woman, and looked and began to laugh. The feet of the dead witch had disappeared entirely, and nothing was left but the silver shoes. She was so old, explained the Witch of the North, that she dried up quickly in the sun. That is the end of her, but the silver shoes are yours 
and you shall have them to wear. She reached down and picked up the shoes, and after shaking the dust out of them, handed them to Dorothy. The Witch of the Yeast was proud of those silver shoes, said one of the munchkins, and there is some charm connected with them. But what it is, we never knew. Dorothy carried the shoes into the house and placed them on the table. Then she came out again to the munchkins and said, I am anxious to get back to my aunt and uncle, for I am sure they will worry about me. Can you help me find my way? The munchkins and the witch first looked at one another, then at Dorothy, and then shook their heads. At the east, not far from here, said one, there is a great desert and none could live to cross it. It is the same as the south, said another, for I have been there and seen it. The south is the country of the quadlings. I am told, said the third man, that it is the same at the west, and that country, where the Winkies live, is ruled by the wicked witch of the west, who would make you her slave if you passed her way. The north is my home, said the old lady, and at its edge is the same great desert that surrounds this land of Oz. I'm afraid, my dear, you will have to live with us. Dorothy began to sob at this, for she felt lonely among all these strange people. Her tears seemed to grieve the kind-hearted munchkins, for they immediately took out their handkerchiefs and began to weep also. As for the little old woman, she took off her cap and balanced the point on the end of her nose while she counted one, two, three, in a solemn voice. At once the cap changed to a slate, on which was written in big white chalk marks, let Dorothy go to the city of emeralds. The little old woman took the slate from her nose and having read the words on it asked, Is your name Dorothy, my dear? Yes, answered the child, looking up and drying her tears. Then you must go to the city of emeralds. Perhaps Oz will help you. Where is this city? It is exactly in the centre of this country and is ruled by Oz, the great wizard I told you of. Is he a good man? inquired the girl anxiously. He's a good wizard. Whether he is a man or not I cannot tell, for I have never seen him. How can I get there? asked Dorothy. You must walk. It is a long journey through a country that is sometimes pleasant and sometimes dark and terrible. However, I will use all the magic arts I know of to keep you from harm. Won't you go with me? pleaded the girl who had begun to look upon the little old woman as her only friend. No, I cannot do that, she replied. But I will give you my kiss, and no one will dare injure a person who has been kissed by the Witch of the North. She came close to Dorothy and kissed her gently on the forehead. Where her lips touched the girl, they left a round, shining mark, as Dorothy found out soon after. The road to the city of emeralds is paved with yellow brick, said the witch, so you cannot miss it. When you get to Oz, do not be afraid of him, but tell your story and ask him to help you. Goodbye, my dear. The three munchkins bowed low to her and wished her a pleasant journey, after which they walked away through the trees. The witch gave Dorothy a friendly little nod whirled around on her heel three times and straight away disappeared, much to the surprise of little Toto, who barked after her loudly enough when she had gone, because he had been afraid even to growl when she stood by. But Dorothy, knowing her to be a witch, had expected her to disappear in just that way, and was not surprised in the least. Chapter 3 How Dorothy Saved the Scarecrow when Dorothy was left alone, she began to feel hungry. So she went to the cupboard and cut herself some bread, which she spread with butter. She gave some to Toto and, taking a pail from the shelf, she carried it down to the little brook and filled it with clear, sparkling water. Toto ran over to the trees and began to bark at the birds sitting there. Dorothy went to get him and saw such delicious fruit hanging from the branches that she gathered some of it, finding it just what she wanted to help out her breakfast. 
Then she went back to the house, and having helped herself and Toto to a good drink of the cool, clear water, she set about making ready for the journey to the City of Emeralds. Dorothy had only one other dress, but that happened to be clean and was hanging on a peg beside her bed. It was gingham with checks of white and blue, and although the blue was somewhat faded with many washings, it was still a pretty frock. The girl washed herself carefully, dressed herself in the clean gingham, and tied her pink sunbonnet on her head. She took a little basket and filled it with bread from the cupboard, laying a white cloth over the top, and then she looked down at her feet and noticed how old and worn her shoes were. They will surely never do for a long journey, Toto, she said, and Toto looked up into her face with his little black eyes and wagged his tail to show he knew what she meant. At that moment, Dorothy saw, lying on the table, the silver shoes that had belonged to the Witch of the East. I wonder if they'll fit me, she said to Toto. They'd be just the thing to take a long walk in, for they could not wear out. She took off her old leather shoes and tried on the silver ones, which fitted her as well as if they'd been made for her. Finally, she picked up her basket. Come along, Toto, she said. We will go to the Emerald City and ask the Great Oz how to get back to Kansas again. She closed the door, locked it, and put the key carefully in the pocket of her dress. And so, with Toto trotting along soberly behind her, she started on her journey. There were several roads nearby, but it did not take her long to find the one paved with yellow bricks. Within a short time, she was walking briskly towards the Emerald City, her silver shoes tinkling merrily on the hard yellow roadbed. The sun shone bright and the birds sang sweetly, and Dorothy did not feel nearly so bad as you might think a little girl who had been suddenly whisked away from her own country and set down in the midst of a strange land. She was surprised, as she walked along, to see how pretty the country was about her. There were neat fences at the sides of the road, painted a dainty blue colour, and beyond them were fields of grain and vegetables in abundance. Evidently, the munchkins were good farmers and able to raise large crops. Once in a while, she would pass a house, and the people came out to look at her and bow low as she went by, for everyone knew she had been the means of destroying the wicked witch and setting them free from bondage. The houses of the munchkins were odd-looking dwellings, for each was round, with a big dome for a roof. All were painted blue, for in this country of the east, blue was the favourite colour. Toward evening, when Dorothy was tired with her long walk and began to wonder where she should pass the night, she came to a house rather larger than the rest. On the green lawn before it, many men and women were dancing. Five little fiddlers played loudly as possible, and the people were laughing and singing, while a big table nearby was loaded with delicious fruits and nuts, pies and cakes, and many other good things to eat. The people greeted Dorothy kindly, and invited her to supper and to pass the night with them, for this was the home of one of the richest munchkins in the land, and his friends were gathered with him to celebrate their freedom from the bondage of the Wicked Witch. Dorothy ate a hearty supper and was waited upon by the rich munchkin himself, whose name was Bok. Then she sat upon a settee and watched the people dance. When Bok saw her silver shoes, he said, You must be a great sorceress. Why? asked the girl. Because you wear silver shoes and have killed the wicked witch. Besides, you have white in your frock. And only witches and sorceresses wear white. My dress is blue and white checked, said Dorothy, smoothing out the wrinkles in it. It is kind of you to wear that, said Bok. Blue is the colour of the munchkins, and white is the witch colour. So we know you are a friendly witch. Dorothy did not know what to say to this, for all the people seemed to think her a witch, and she knew very well she was an ordinary little girl who had come by the chance of a cyclone into a strange land. When she had tired watching the dancing, 
Bok led her into the house, where he gave her a room with a pretty bed in it. The sheets were made of blue cloth, and Dorothy slept soundly in them until morning, with Toto curled up on the blue rug beside her. She ate a hearty breakfast and watched a wee munchkin baby who played with Toto and pulled his tail and crowed and laughed in a way that greatly amused Dorothy. Toto was a fine curiosity to all the people, for they had never seen a dog before. Then she said her goodbyes and again started along the yellow brick road. When she had gone several miles, she thought she would stop to rest and so climbed to the top of a fence beside the road and sat down. There was a great cornfield beyond the fence and not far away she saw a scarecrow placed high on a pole to keep the birds from the ripe corn. Dorothy leaned her chin upon her hand and gazed thoughtfully at the scarecrow. Its head was a small sack stuffed with straw, with eyes, nose and mouth painted on it to represent a face. An old pointed blue hat that had belonged to some munchkin was perched on his head and the rest of the figure was a blue suit of clothes, worn and faded, which had also been stuffed with straw. On the feet were some old boots with blue tops, such as every man wore in this country, and the figure was raised above the stalks of corn by means of the pole stuck up its back. While Dorothy was looking earnestly into the strange painted face of the scarecrow, she was surprised to see one of the eyes slowly wink at her. She thought she must have been mistaken at first, for none of the scarecrows in Kansas ever wink. But presently, the figure nodded his head to her in a friendly way. Then she climbed down from the fence and walked up to it, while Toto ran around the pole and barked. Good day, said the scarecrow in a rather husky voice. Did you speak? asked the girl in wonder. Certainly, answered the scarecrow. How do you do? Oh, I'm pretty well, thank you, replied Dorothy politely. How do you do? I'm not feeling well, said the scarecrow with a smile. For it is very tedious being perched up here night and day to scare away crows. Can't you get down? asked Dorothy. No, for this pole is stuck up my back. If you will please take away the pole, I shall be greatly obliged to you. Dorothy reached up both arms and lifted the figure off the pole. For being stuffed with straw, it was quite light. Oh, thank you very much, said the scarecrow, when he had been set down on the ground. I feel like a new man. Dorothy was puzzled at this, for it sounded strange to hear a stuffed man speak, and to see him bow and walk along beside her. Who are you? asked the scarecrow when he had stretched himself and yawned. And where are you going? My name is Dorothy, said the girl, and I am going to the Emerald City to ask the Great Oz to send me back to Kansas. Where's the Emerald City? he inquired. And who is Oz? Why, don't you know? she returned in surprise. No, indeed. I, I don't know anything, you see. I am stuffed and I have no brains at all, he answered sadly. Oh, said Dorothy, I'm awfully sorry for you. Do you think, he asked, if I go to the Emerald City with you, that Oz would give me some brains? I cannot tell, she returned, but you may come with me if you like. If Oz will not give you any brains, you'll be no worse off than you are now. That is true, said the Scarecrow. You see, he continued confidentially, I don't mind my arms and legs and body being stuffed, because I cannot get hurt. If anyone treads on my toes or sticks a pin in me, it doesn't matter, for I can't feel it. But I do not want people to call me a fool, and if my head stays stuffed with straw instead of with brains as yours is, how am I ever to know anything? I understand how you feel, said the little girl, who was truly very sorry for him. If you will come with me, I'll ask Oz to do all he can for you. Thank you, he answered gratefully. They walked back to the road. Dorothy helped him over the fence and they started along the path of yellow brick for the Emerald City. Toto did not like this addition to the party at first. He smelled around the stuffed man as if he suspected there might be a nest of rats in the straw and he often growled in an unfriendly way at the scarecrow. 
Don't mind Toto, said Dorothy to her new friend. He never bites. Oh, I'm not afraid, replied the scarecrow. He can't hurt the straw. Do let me carry that basket for you. I should not mind it, for I can't get tired. I'll tell you a secret, he continued as he walked along. There is only one thing in the world I'm afraid of. What's that? asked Dorothy. The munchkin farmer who made you? No, answered the scarecrow. It's a lighted match. After an hour or so, the light faded away and they found themselves stumbling along in the darkness. Dorothy could not see at all, but Toto could, for some dogs see very well in the dark, and the scarecrow declared he could see just as well as by day. So she took a hold of his arm and managed to get along fairly well. If you see any house or any place where we can pass the night, she said, you must tell me, for it is very uncomfortable walking in the dark. Soon after, the scarecrow stopped. I see a little cottage at the right of us, he said, built of logs and branches. Shall we go there? Yes, indeed, answered the child. I'm all tired out. So the scarecrow led her through the trees until they reached the cottage and Dorothy entered and found a bed of dried leaves in one corner. She lay down at once, and with Toto beside her, soon fell into a sound sleep. The scarecrow, who was never tired, stood up in another corner and waited patiently until morning came. Chapter 5 The Rescue of the Tin Woodman When Dorothy awoke, the sun was shining through the trees and Toto had long been out chasing birds around him and squirrels. She sat up and looked around her. There was the scarecrow, still standing patiently in his corner, waiting for her. We must go and search for water, she said to him. Why do you want water? he asked. To wash my face clean after the dust of the road and to drink so the dry bread will not stick in my throat. It must be inconvenient to be made of flesh, said the scarecrow thoughtfully, for you must sleep and eat and drink. However, you have brains, and it is worth a lot of bother to be able to think properly. They left the cottage and walked through the trees until they found a little spring of clear water, where Dorothy drank and bathed and ate her breakfast. She saw there was not much bread left in the basket, and the girl was thankful the scarecrow did not have to eat anything, for there was scarcely enough for herself and Toto for the day. When she had finished her meal and was about to go back to the road of yellow brick, she was startled to hear a deep groan nearby. What was that? she asked timidly. I cannot imagine, replied the scarecrow, but we can go and see. Just then, Another groan reached their ears, and the sound seemed to come from behind them. They turned and walked through the forest a few steps, when Dorothy discovered something shining in a ray of sunshine that fell between the trees. She ran to the place and then stopped short, with a little cry of surprise. One of the big trees had been partly chopped through, and standing beside it with an uplifted axe in his hands was a man made entirely of tin. His head and arms and legs were jointed upon his body, but he stood perfectly motionless, as if he could not stir at all. Dorothy looked at him in amazement, and so did the scarecrow, while Toto barked sharply and made a snap at the tin legs, which hurt his teeth. Yes, answered the tin man, I did. I've been groaning for more than a year, and no one has ever heard me before or come to help me. What can I do for you? She inquired softly, for she was moved by the sad voice in which the man spoke. Get an oil can and oil my joints, he answered. They are rusted so badly that I cannot move them at all. If I am well oiled, I shall soon be all right again. You will find an oil can on a shelf in my cottage. Dorothy at once ran back to the cottage and found the oil can. And then she returned and asked anxiously, Where are your joints? Oil my neck first, replied the tin woodman. So she oiled it, and as it was quite badly rusted, 
The scarecrow took hold of the tin head and moved it gently from side to side until it worked freely, and then the man could turn it himself. Now oil the joints in my arms, he said, and Dorothy oiled them, and the scarecrow bent them carefully until they were quite free from rust and good as new. The tin woodman gave a sigh of satisfaction and lowered his axe, which he leaned against the tree. This is a great comfort, he said. I have been holding that axe in the air ever since I rusted, and I am glad to be able to put it down at last. Now, if you will oil the joints of my legs, I shall be all right once more. So they oiled his legs until he could move them freely, and he thanked them again and again for his release, for he seemed a very polite creature and very grateful. I might have stood there always if you had not come along, he said, so you have certainly saved my life. How did you happen to be here? We are on our way to the Emerald City to see the Great Oz, she answered, and we stopped at your cottage to pass the night. Why do you wish to see Oz? he asked. I want him to send me back to Kansas, and the Scarecrow wants him to put a few brains into his head, she replied. The Tin Woodman appeared to think deeply for a moment. Then he said, Do you suppose Oz could give me a heart? Why, I guess so, Dorothy answered. It would be as easy as to give the Scarecrow brains. True, the Tin Woodman returned. So, if you will allow me to join your party, I will also go to the Emerald City and ask Oz to help me. Come along, said the Scarecrow heartily, and Dorothy added that she would be pleased to have his company. So, the Tin Woodman shouldered his axe, and they all passed through the forest until they came to the road that was paved with yellow brick. The Tin Woodman had asked Dorothy to put the oil can in her basket, for he said, if I should get caught in the rain and rust again, I would need the oil can badly. It was a bit of good luck to have their new comrade join the party, for soon after they had begun their journey again, they came to a place where the trees and branches grew so thick over the road that the travellers could not pass. But the tin woodman set to work with his axe and chopped so well that soon he had cleared a passage for the entire party. Dorothy was thinking so earnestly as they walked along that she did not notice when the scarecrow stumbled into a hole and rolled over to the side of the road. Indeed, he was obliged to call her to help him up again. Why didn't you walk around the hole? asked the tin woodman. I don't know enough, replied the scarecrow cheerfully. My head is stuffed with straw, you know, and that is why I'm going to Oz to ask him for some brains. Oh, I see, said the tin woodman. But after all, brains are not the best thing in the world. Have you any? inquired the scarecrow. No, my head is quite empty, answered the woodman. But once I had brains, and a heart also. So, having tried them both, I should much rather have a heart. And why is that? asked the scarecrow. I will tell you my story, and then you will know. So... While they were walking through the forest, the tin woodman told the following story. I was born the son of a woodman who chopped down trees in the forest and sold the wood for a living. When I grew up, I too became a woodchopper, and after my father died, I took care of my old mother as long as she lived. Then I made up my mind that instead of living alone, I would marry so that I might not become lonely. There was one of the munchkin girls who was so beautiful that I soon grew to love her with all my heart. She, on her part, promised to marry me as soon as I could earn enough money to build a better house for her. So I set to work, harder than ever. But the girl lived with an old woman who did not want her to marry anyone, for she was so lazy she wished the girl to remain with her and do the cooking and the housework. So the old woman went to the Wicked Witch of the East and promised her two sheep and a cow if she would prevent the marriage. Thereupon, the Wicked Witch enchanted my axe, and when I was chopping away at my best one day, for I was anxious to get the new house and my wife as soon as possible, the axe slipped all at once, and I cut off my left leg. 
This at first seemed a great misfortune, for I knew a one-legged man could not do very well as a woodchopper. So I went to a tinsmith and had him make me a new leg out of tin. The leg worked very well once I was used to it, but my action angered the wicked witch of the east, for she had promised the old woman I should not marry the pretty munchkin girl. When I began chopping again, my axe slipped and cut my right leg off. Again, I went to the tinsmith, and again he made me a leg out of tin. After this, the enchanted axe cut off my arms, one after the other, but nothing daunted, and I had them replaced with tin ones. The wicked witch then made the axe slip and cut off my head, and at first I thought this was the end of me, but the tinsmith happened to come along and he made me a new head out of tin. I thought I had beaten the wicked witch then, and I worked even harder, but I little knew how cruel my enemy could be. She thought of a new way to kill my love for the beautiful munchkin maiden, and made my axe slip again so that it cut right through my body, splitting me into two halves. Once more the tinsmith came to my help and made me a body of tin, fastening my tin arms and legs and head to it by means of joints so that I could move around as well as ever. But alas, I had now no heart, so I lost all my love for the munchkin girl and did not care whether I married her or not. I suppose she is still living with the old woman, waiting for me to come after her. My body shone so brightly in the sun that I felt very proud of it, and it did not matter now if my axe slipped, for it could not cut me. There was only one danger, that my joints would rust, but I kept an oil can in my cottage and took care to oil myself whenever I needed it. However, there came a day when I forgot to do this, and, being caught in a rainstorm, before I thought of the danger, my joints had rusted, and I was left to stand in the woods until you came to help me. It was a terrible thing to undergo, but during the year I stood there, I had time to think that the greatest loss I had known was the loss of my heart. While I was in love, I was the happiest man on earth, but no one can love who has not a heart, and so I am resolved to ask Oz to give me one. If he does, I will go back to the munchkin maiden and marry her. Both Dorothy and Scarecrow had been greatly interested in the story of the Tin Woodman, and now they knew why he was so anxious to get a new heart. All the same, said the Scarecrow, I shall ask for brains instead of a heart, for a fool would not know what to do with a heart if he had one. I shall take the heart, returned the Tin Woodman, for brains do not make one happy, and happiness is the best thing in the world. Dorothy did not say anything, for she was puzzled to know which of her two friends was right, and she decided that if she could only get back to Kansas and Aunt Em, it did not matter so much whether the woodman had no brains and the scarecrow no heart, or each got what he wanted. What worried her most was that the bread was nearly gone, and another meal for herself and Toto would empty the basket. To be sure, neither the woodman nor the scarecrow ever ate anything, but she was not made of tin nor straw, and could not live unless she was fed. Chapter 6 The Cowardly Lion All this time, Dorothy and her companions had been walking through the thick woods. The road was still paved with yellow brick, but these were much covered by dried branches and dead leaves from the trees, and the walking was not at all good. There were a few birds in this part of the forest, for birds love the open country where there is plenty of sunshine. But now and then there came a deep growl from some wild animal hidden among the trees. These sounds made the little girl's heart beat fast, for she did not know what made them. But Toto knew, and he walked close to Dorothy's side, and did not even bark in return. How long will it be? the child asked of the tin woodman before we are out of the forest? I cannot tell, was the answer, for I have never been to the Emerald City. But my father went there once, when I was a boy, and he said that it was a long journey through a dangerous country. Although, nearer to the city where Oz dwells, the country is beautiful. But I am not afraid, so long as I have my oil can, and nothing can hurt the scarecrow, while you bear upon your forehead the mark of the good witch's kiss, 
and that will protect you from harm. But Toto, said the girl anxiously, what will protect him? We must protect him ourselves if he is in danger, replied the Tin Woodman. And just as he spoke, there came from the forest a terrible roar, and the next moment a great lion bounded into the road. With one blow of his paw, he sent the scarecrow spinning over and over to the edge of the road, and then he struck at the Tin Woodman with his sharp claws. But, to the lion's surprise, he could make no impression on the tin, although the woodman fell over in the road and lay still. Little Toto, now that he had an enemy to face, ran barking toward the lion, and the great beast had opened his mouth to bite the dog, when Dorothy, fearing Toto would be killed and heedless of danger, rushed forward and slapped the lion upon his nose as hard as she could, while she cried out, Don't you dare to bite Toto! You ought to be ashamed of yourself, a big beast like you, to bite a poor little dog. I didn't bite him, said the lion, as he rubbed his nose with his paw where Dorothy had hit it. No, but you tried to, she retorted. You are nothing but a big coward. I know it, said the lion, hanging his head in shame. I've always known it, but how can I help it? I don't know, I'm sure. To think of your striking a stuffed man like the poor scarecrow. Is he stuffed? asked the lion in surprise, as he watched her pick up the scarecrow and set him upon his feet while she patted him into shape again. Of course he's stuffed, replied Dorothy, who was still angry. Well, that's why he went over so easily, remarked the lion. It astonished me to see him whirl around so. Is the other one stuffed also? No, said Dorothy. He's made of tin, and she helped the woodman up again. That's why he nearly blunted my claws, said the lion. When they scratched against the tin, it made a cold shiver run down my back. What is that little animal you are so tender of? He's my dog, Toto, answered Dorothy. Is he made of tin, or stuffed, asked the lion. Neither, he's uh, a meat dog, said the girl. Oh, he's a curious little animal, and seems remarkably small now that I look at him. No one would think of biting such a little thing, except a coward like me, continued the lion sadly. What makes you a coward? asked Dorothy, looking at the great beast in wonder, for he was as big as a small horse. It's a mystery, replied the lion. I suppose I was born that way. All the other animals in the forest naturally expect me to be brave, for the lion is everywhere thought to be king of the beasts. I learned that if I roared very loudly, every living thing was frightened and got out of my way. Whenever I've met a man I've been awfully scared, but I just roared at him and he's always run away as fast as he could go. If the elephants and the tigers and the bears had ever tried to fight me, I should have run off myself. I'm such a coward. But just as soon as they hear me roar, they all try to get away from me. And of course, I let them go. But that isn't right. The King of Beasts shouldn't be a coward, said the Scarecrow. I know it, returned the Lion, wiping a tear from his eye with the tip of his tail. It is my great sorrow and makes my life very unhappy. But whenever there is danger... My heart begins to beat fast. Perhaps you have heart disease, said the Tin Woodman. It may be, said the Lion. If you have, continued the Tin Woodman, you ought to be glad, for it proves you have a heart. For my part, I have no heart, so I cannot have heart disease. Perhaps, said the Lion thoughtfully, if I had no heart, I should not be a coward. Have you brains? asked the Scarecrow. I suppose so. I've never looked to see, replied the lion. I am going to the great Oz to ask him to give me some, remarked the scarecrow, for my head is stuffed with straw. And I am going to ask him to give me a heart, said the woodman. And I am going to ask him to send Toto and me back to Kansas, added Dorothy. Do you think Oz could give me courage, asked the cowardly lion. Just as easily as he could give me brains, said the scarecrow. Or give me a heart, said the Tin Woodman, 
will send me back to Kansas, said Dorothy. Then, if you don't mind, I'll go with you, said the lion, for my life is simply unbearable without a bit of courage. You will be very welcome, answered Dorothy, for you will help to keep away the other wild beasts. It seems to me they must be more cowardly than you if they allow you to scare them so easily. They really are, said the lion, but that doesn't make me any braver, and as long as I know myself to be a coward, I shall be unhappy. So, once more, the little company set off upon the journey, the lion walking with stately strides at Dorothy's side. Toto did not approve of this new comrade at first, for he could not forget how nearly he had been crushed between the lion's great jaws. But after a time, he became more at ease, and presently Toto and the cowardly lion had grown to be good friends. During the rest of the day, there was no other adventure to mar the peace of their journey. Once, indeed, the tin woodman stepped upon a beetle that was crawling along the road and killed the poor little thing. This made the tin woodman very unhappy, for he was always careful not to hurt any living creature, and as he walked along, he wept several tears of sorrow and regret. These tears ran slowly down his face and over the hinges of his jaw, and there they rusted. When Dorothy presently asked him a question, the tin woodman could not open his mouth, for his jaws was tightly rusted together. He became greatly frightened at this and made many motions to Dorothy to relieve him, but she could not understand. The lion was also puzzled to know what was wrong, but the scarecrow seized the oil can from Dorothy's basket and oiled the woodsman's jaws so that after a few moments he could talk as well as before. This will serve me a lesson, said he, to look where I step, for if I should kill another bug or beetle, I should surely cry again, and the crying rusts my jaws so that I cannot speak. Thereafter, he walked very carefully, with his eyes on the road, and when he saw a tiny ant toiling by, he would step over it so as not to harm it. The tin woodman knew very well he had no heart, and therefore he took great care never to be cruel or unkind to anything. You people with hearts, he said, have something to guide you, and need never do wrong. But I have no heart, and so I must be very careful. When Oz gives me a heart, of course, I needn't mind so much. Chapter 7 The Journey to the Great Oz They were obliged to camp out that night under a large tree in the forest, for there were no houses near. The tree made a good, thick covering to protect them from the dew, and the tin woodman chopped a great pile of wood with his axe, and Dorothy built a splendid fire that warmed her and made her feel less lonely. She and Toto ate the last of their bread, and now she did not know what they would do for breakfast. If you wish, said the lion, I will go into the forest and kill a deer for you. You can roast it by the fire, since your tastes are so peculiar that you prefer cooked food and then you'll have a very good breakfast. Don't, please don't, begged the tin woodman. I should certainly weep if you killed a poor deer, and then my jaws would rust again. But the lion went away into the forest and found his own supper, and no one ever knew what it was, for he didn't mention it. And the scarecrow found a tree full of nuts and filled Dorothy's basket with them, so that she would not be hungry for a long time. She thought this was very kind and thoughtful of the scarecrow, but she laughed heartily at the awkward way in which the poor creature picked up the nuts. His padded hands were so clumsy and the nuts were so small that he dropped almost as many as he put in the basket. But the scarecrow did not mind how long it took him to fill the basket, for it enabled him to keep away from the fire, as he feared a spark might get into his straw and burn him up. So. He kept a good distance away from the flames and only came near to cover Dorothy with dry leaves when she lay down to sleep. These kept her very snug and warm and she slept soundly until morning. When it was daylight, the girl bathed her face in a little rippling brook and soon after they all started toward the Emerald City. This was to be an eventful day for the travellers. They had hardly been walking an hour when they saw before them a great ditch that crossed the road and divided the forest as far as they could see on either side. It was a very wide ditch, 
and when they crept up to the edge and looked into it, they could see it was also very deep, and there were many big, jagged rocks at the bottom. The sides were so steep that none of them could climb down, and for a moment it seemed their journey must end. What shall we do? asked Dorothy despairingly. I haven't the faintest idea, said the Tin Woodman, and the Lion shook his shaggy mane and looked thoughtful. But the Scarecrow said, We cannot fly, that is certain, neither can we climb down into this great ditch. Therefore, if we cannot jump over it, we must stop where we are. I think I could jump it, said the Cowardly Lion, after measuring the distance carefully in his mind. Then we're all right, answered the Scarecrow, for you can carry us all over on your back one at a time. Well, I'll try it, said the Lion. Who will go first? I will, declared the Scarecrow, for if you found that you could not jump over the gulf, Dorothy would be killed or the Tin Woodman badly dented on the rocks below. But if I am on your back, it will not matter so much, for the fall would not hurt me at all. I'm terribly afraid of falling myself, said the cowardly lion, but I suppose there is nothing to do but try it. So get on my back and we will make the attempt. The scarecrow sat upon the lion's back and the big beast walked to the edge of the gulf and crouched down. Why don't you just run and jump? asked the scarecrow. Because that isn't the way we lions do these things, he replied. Then, giving a great spring, he shot through the air and landed safely on the other side. They were all greatly pleased to see how easily he did it, and after the scarecrow had got down from his back, the lion sprang across the ditch again. Dorothy thought she would go next, so she took Toto in her arms and climbed onto the lion's back, holding tightly to his mane with one hand. The next moment it seemed as if she were flying through the air, and then, before she had time to think about it, she was safe on the other side. The lion went back a third time and got the tin woodman, and then they all sat down for a few moments to give the beast a chance to rest, for his great leaps had made his breath short, and he panted like a big dog that had been running too long. They found the forest very thick on this side, and it looked dark and gloomy. After the lion had rested, they started along the road of yellow brick, silently wondering, each in his own mind, if they would ever come to the end of the woods and reach the bright sunshine again. To add to their discomfort, they soon heard strange noises in the depths of the forest, and the lion whispered to them that it was in this part of the country that the Kalidas lived. What are the Kalidas? asked the girl. They are monstrous beasts, with bodies like bears and heads like tigers, replied the lion, and with claws so long and sharp that they could tear me in two as easily as I could Toto. I'm terribly afraid of the Kalidas. I'm not surprised that you are, returned Dorothy. They must be dreadful beasts. The lion was about to reply when suddenly they came to another gulf across the road, but this one was so broad and deep the lion knew at once he could not leap across it. So they sat down to consider what they should do, and after serious thought the scarecrow said, Here is a great tree standing close to the ditch. If the tin woodman can chop it down so that it will fall to the other side, we can walk across it easily. Hmm, that's a first-rate idea, said the lion. One would almost suspect you had brains in your head instead of straw. The tin woodman set to work at once, and so sharp was his axe that the tree was soon chopped nearly through. Then the lion put his strong front legs against the tree and pushed with all his might, and slowly the big tree tipped and fell with a crash across the ditch, with its top branches on the other side. They had just started to cross this queer bridge when a sharp growl made them all look up, and to their horror they saw running towards them two great beasts with bodies like bears and heads like tigers. They are the Kalidas, said the cowardly lion, beginning to tremble. Quick, cried the scarecrow, let us cross over. So Dorothy went first, holding Toto in her arms. The tin woodman followed, and the scarecrow came next. The lion, although he was certainly afraid, turned to face the Kalidas, and he gave so loud and terrible a roar that Dorothy screamed and the scarecrow fell over backward, while even the fierce beast stopped short and looked at him in surprise. 
but seeing they were bigger than the lion, and remembering that there were two of them, and only one of him, the Calidas again rushed forward, and the lion crossed over the tree and turned to see what they would do next. Without stopping an instant, the fierce beasts also began to cross the tree, and the lion said to Dorothy, We are lost, for they will surely tear us to pieces with their sharp claws, but stand close behind me, and I will fight them as long as I am alive. Wait a minute, called the scarecrow. He'd been thinking what was best to be done, and now he asked the woodman to chop away the end of the tree that rested on their side of the ditch. The tin woodman began to use his axe at once, and, just as the two calidars were nearly across, the tree fell with a crash into the gulf, carrying the ugly, snarling brutes with it, and both were dashed to pieces on the sharp rocks at the bottom. Well, said the cowardly lion, drawing a long breath of relief, I see we are going to live a little while longer, and I am glad of it, for it must be a very uncomfortable thing not to be alive. Those creatures frightened me so badly that my heart is beating yet. Ah, said the tin woodman sadly, I wish I had a heart to beat. This adventure made the travellers more anxious than ever to get out of the forest, and they walked so fast that Dorothy became tired and had to ride on the lion's back. To their great joy, the trees became thinner the further they advanced, and in the afternoon they suddenly came upon a broad river flowing swiftly just before them. On the other side of the water, they could see the road of yellow brick running through a beautiful country, with green meadows dotted with bright flowers, and all the road bordered with trees hanging full of delicious fruits. They were greatly pleased to see this delightful country before them. How shall we cross the river? asked Dorothy. That is easily done, replied the scarecrow. The tin woodman must build us a raft so that we can float to the other side. So the tin woodman took his axe and began to chop down small trees to make a raft. And while he was busy, the scarecrow found on the river bank a tree full of fine fruit. This pleased Dorothy, who had eaten nothing but nuts all day, and she made a hearty meal of the ripe fruit. But it takes time to make a raft, even when one is as industrious and untiring as the tin woodman. And when night came, the work was not done. So they found a cosy place under the trees where they slept well until the morning, and Dorothy dreamed of the Emerald City and of the good Wizard Oz, who would soon send her back to her own home again. Chapter 8 The Deadly Poppy Field Our little party of travellers awakened the next morning refreshed and full of hope, and Dorothy breakfasted like a princess of peaches and plums from the trees beside the river. Behind them was the dark forest they had passed safely through, although they had suffered many discouragements. But before them was a lovely, sunny country that seemed to beckon them on to the Emerald City. To be sure, the broad river now cut them off from this beautiful land. But the raft was nearly done, and after the tin woodman had cut a few more logs and fastened them together with wooden pins, they were ready to start. Dorothy sat down in the middle of the raft and held Toto in her arms. When the cowardly lion stepped upon the raft, it tipped badly, for he was big and heavy. But the scarecrow and the tin woodman stood upon the other end to steady it, and they had long poles in their hands to push the raft through the water. They got along quite well at first. When they reached the middle of the river, the swift current swept the raft downstream, farther and farther away from the road of yellow brick. And the water grew so deep that the long poles would not touch the bottom. This is bad, said the tin woodman, for if we cannot get to the land, we shall be carried into the country of the Wicked Witch of the West, and she will enchant us and make us her slaves. And then I should get no brains, said the scarecrow, and I should get no courage, said the cowardly lion, and I should get no heart, said the tin woodman, and I should never get back to Kansas, said Dorothy. We must certainly get to the Emerald City if we can, the Scarecrow continued, and he pushed so hard on his long pole that it stuck fast in the mud at the bottom of the river. Then, before he could pull it out again, or let go, the raft was swept away, and the poor Scarecrow was left clinging to the pole in the middle of the river. Goodbye, he called after them, 
and they were very sorry to leave him. Indeed, the Tin Woodman began to cry, but fortunately remembered that he might rust, and so dried his tears on Dorothy's apron. Of course, this was a bad thing for the Scarecrow. Down the stream, the raft floated, and the poor Scarecrow was left far behind. Then the Lion said, Something must be done to save us. I think I can swim to the shore and pull the raft after me, if you will only hold fast to the tip of my tail. So he sprang into the water, and the Tin Woodman caught fast hold of his tail. Then the Lion began to swim with all his might toward the shore. It was hard work, although he was so big, and by and by they were drawn out of the current. And then Dorothy took the Tin Woodman's long pole and helped push the raft to land. They were all tired out when they reached the shore at last and stepped off upon the pretty green grass, and they also knew that the stream had carried them a long way past the road of yellow brick that led to the Emerald City. What shall we do now? asked the Tin Woodman as the lion lay down on the grass to let the sun dry him. We must get back to the road in some way, said Dorothy. The best plan will be to walk along the river bank until we come to the road again, remarked the lion. So, when they were rested, Dorothy picked up her basket and they started along the grassy bank to the road from which the river had carried them. It was a lovely country, with plenty of flowers and fruit trees and sunshine to cheer them, and had they not felt so sorry for the poor scarecrow, they could have been very happy. They walked along as fast as they could, Dorothy only stopping once to pick a beautiful flower, and after a time, the tin woodman cried out, Look! Then they all looked at the river and saw the scarecrow perched upon his pole in the middle of the water, looking very lonely and sad. What can we do to save him? asked Dorothy. The lion and the woodman both shook their heads, for they did not know. So they sat down upon the bank and gazed wistfully at the scarecrow, until a stork flew by, who, upon seeing them, stopped to rest at the water's edge. Who are you, and where are you going? asked the stork. I'm Dorothy, answered the girl, and these are my friends the tin woodman and the cowardly lion, and we're going to the Emerald City. This isn't the road, said the stork, as she twisted her long neck and looked sharply at the queer party. I know it, returned Dorothy, but we have lost the scarecrow and are wondering how we shall get him again. Where is he? asked the stork. Over there in the river, answered the little girl. If he wasn't so big and heavy, I would get him for you, remarked the stork. He isn't heavy a bit, said Dorothy eagerly, for he is stuffed with straw. And if you'll bring him back to us, we shall thank you ever and ever so much. Well, I'll try, said the stork. But if I find he is too heavy to carry, I shall have to drop him in the river again. So the big bird flew into the air and over the water till she came to where the scarecrow was perched upon his pole. Then the stork, with her great claws, grabbed the scarecrow by the arm and carried him up into the air and back to the bank where Dorothy and the Lion and the Tin Woodman and Toto were sitting. When the Scarecrow found himself among his friends again, he was so happy that he hugged them all, even the Lion and Toto, and as they walked along, he sang Tol de Rai de Yo at every step. He felt so happy. I was afraid I shall have to stay in that river forever, he said, but the kind stork saved me, and if I ever get any brains, I shall find the stork again and do us some kindness in return. They walked along, listening to the singing of the brightly coloured birds and looking at the lovely flowers which now became so thick that the ground was carpeted with them. They were big and yellow and white and blue and purple blossoms, besides great clusters of scarlet poppies which were so brilliant in colour that they almost dazzled Dorothy's eyes. They now came upon more and more of the big scarlet poppies and fewer and fewer of the other flowers, and soon they found themselves in the midst of a great meadow of poppies. Now, it is well known that when there are many of these flowers together, their odour is so powerful that anyone who breathes it in falls asleep, and if the sleeper is not carried away from the scent of the flowers, he sleeps on and on forever. But Dorothy did not know this, nor could she get away from the bright red flowers that were everywhere about, 
So presently her eyes grew heavy and she felt she must sit down to rest and sleep. But the tin woodman would not let her do this. We must hurry and get back to the road of yellow brick before dark, he said, and the scarecrow agreed with him. So they kept walking until Dorothy could stand no longer. Her eyes closed in spite of herself, and she forgot where she was and fell among the poppies, fast asleep. What shall we do? asked the tin woodman. If we leave her here, she will die, said the lion. The smell of the flowers is killing us all. I myself can scarcely keep my eyes open, and the dog is asleep already. It was true. Toto had fallen down beside his little mistress. But the scarecrow and the tin woodman, not being made of flesh, were not troubled by the scent of the flowers. Run fast, said the scarecrow to the lion, and get out of this deadly flower bed as soon as you can. We will bring the little girl with us, but if you should fall asleep, you are too big to be carried. So the lion aroused himself and bounded forward as fast as he could go. In a moment, he was out of sight. Let us make a chair with our hands and carry her, said the scarecrow. So they picked up Toto and put the dog in Dorothy's lap, and then they made a chair with their hands for the seat and their arms for the arms and carried the sleeping girl between them through the flowers. On and on they walked, and it seemed like the great carpet of deadly flowers that surrounded them would never end. They followed the bend of the river, and at last came upon their friend the lion, lying fast asleep among the poppies. The flowers had been too strong for the huge beast, and he had given up at last, and fallen only a short distance from the end of the poppy bed, where the sweet grass spread in the beautiful green fields before them. We can do nothing for him, said the tin woodman sadly, for he is too heavy to lift. We must leave him here to sleep on forever, and perhaps he will dream that he has found courage at last. I'm sorry, said the scarecrow. The lion was a very good comrade for one so cowardly, but let us go on. They carried the sleeping girl to a pretty spot beside the river, far enough from the poppy field to prevent her breathing any more of the poison of the flowers and there they laid her gently on the soft grass and waited for the fresh breeze to waken her. Chapter 9 The Queen of the Field Mice We cannot be far from the road of yellow brick now, remarked the scarecrow as he stood beside the girl, for we have come nearly as far as the river carried us away. The tin woodman was about to reply when he heard a low growl, and, turning his head, which worked beautifully on hinges, he saw a strange beast come bounding over the grass toward them. It was indeed a great yellow wildcat, and the woodman thought it must be chasing something, for its ears were lying close to its head and its mouth was wide open, showing two rows of ugly teeth, while its red eyes glowed like balls of fire. As it came nearer, the tin woodman saw that running before the beast was a little grey field mouse, and although he had no heart, he knew it was wrong for the wild cat to try and kill such a pretty, harmless creature. So, the woodman raised his axe, and as the wild cat ran by, he gave it a quick blow that cut the beast's head clean off from its body, and it rolled over at his feet in two pieces. The field mouse, now that it was freed from its enemy, stopped short, and coming slowly up to the woodman, it said in a squeaky little voice, Oh, thank you. Thank you ever so much for saving my life. Don't speak of it, I beg of you, replied the woodman. I have no heart, you know, so I am careful to help all those who may need a friend, even if it happens to only be a mouse. Only a mouse? cried the little animal indignantly. Why, I am a queen, the queen of all the field mice. Oh, indeed, said the woodman, making a bow. Therefore, you have done a great deed, as well as a brave one, in saving my life, added the queen. At that moment, several mice were seen running up as fast as their little legs could carry them, and when they saw their queen, they exclaimed, Oh, your majesty, we thought you would be killed. How did you manage to escape the great wild cat? They all bowed so low to the little queen that they almost stood upon their heads. This funny tin man, she answered, killed the wild cat and saved my life. So hereafter you must all serve him and obey his slightest wish. We will, cried all the mice, 
in a shrill chorus. Is there anything we can do to repay you for saving the life of our queen? Nothing that I know of, answered the woodman. But the scarecrow, who had been trying to think, but could not because his head was still stuffed with straw, said quickly, Oh yes, you can save our friend, the cowardly lion, who was asleep in the poppy bed. Very well, said the queen. But what shall we do? Are there many of these mice which called you queen and are willing to obey you? Oh yes, there are thousands, she replied. Then send for them all to come here as soon as possible, and let each one bring a long piece of string. The queen turned to the mice that attended her and told them to go at once and get all her people. As soon as they heard her orders, they ran away in every direction as fast as possible. Now, said the scarecrow to the tin woodman, you must go to those trees by the riverside and make a truck that will carry the lion. So the woodman went at once to the trees and began to work, and he soon made a truck out of the limbs of trees, from which he chopped away all the leaves and branches. So fast and so well did he work that by the time the mice began to arrive, the truck was all ready for them. They came from all directions, and there were thousands of them. It was about this time that Dorothy woke up from her long sleep and opened her eyes. She was greatly astonished to find herself lying upon the grass with thousands of mice standing around and looking at her timidly. But the scarecrow told her everything, and turning to the dignified little mouse, he said, Permit me to introduce you to Her Majesty, the Queen. Dorothy nodded gravely, and the Queen made a curtsy, after which she became quite friendly with the little girl. The Scarecrow and the Woodman now began to fasten the mice to the truck, using the strings they had brought. One end of a string was tied around the neck of each mouse, and the other entered the truck. Of course, the truck was a thousand times bigger than any of the mice who were to draw it, but when all the mice had been harnessed, they were able to pull it quite easily. Even the Scarecrow and the Tin Woodman could sit on it, and were drawn swiftly by their queer little horses to the place where the lion lay asleep. After a great deal of hard work, for the lion was heavy, they managed to get him up on the truck. Then the Queen hurriedly gave her people the order to start, for she feared if the mice stayed among the poppies for too long, they also would fall asleep. At first, the little creatures, many though they were, could hardly stir the heavily loaded truck. But the woodman and the scarecrow both pushed from behind, and they got along better. Soon, they rolled the lion out of the poppy bed to the green fields, where he could breathe the sweet fresh air again, instead of the poisonous scent of the flowers. Dorothy came to meet them, and thanked the little mice warmly for saving her companion from death. She had grown so fond of the big lion, she was glad he had been rescued. Then the mice were unharnessed from the truck and scampered away through the grass to their homes. The queen of the mice was the last to leave. If you ever need us again, she said, come out into the field and call, and we shall hear you and come to your assistance. Goodbye. Goodbye, they all answered, and away the queen ran, while Dorothy held Toto tightly lest he should run after her and frighten her. After this, they sat down beside the lion until he should awaken, and the scarecrow brought Dorothy some fruit from a nearby tree, which she ate for dinner. Chapter 10 The Guardian of the Gate It was some time before the cowardly lion awakened, for he had lain among the poppies a long while, breathing in their deadly fragrance. But when he did open his eyes and roll off the truck, he was very glad to find himself still alive. I ran as fast as I could, he said, sitting down and yawning, but the flowers were too strong for me. How did you get me out? Then they told him of the field mice, and how they had generously saved him from death, and the cowardly lion laughed and said, I have always thought myself very big and terrible, yet such little things as flowers came near to killing me and such small animals as mice have saved my life. How strange it all is. But comrades, what shall we do now? We must journey on until we find the road of yellow brick again, said Dorothy, and then we can keep on to the Emerald City. So, the lion being fully refreshed and feeling quite himself again, they all started upon the journey, greatly enjoying the walk through the soft, fresh grass, 
and it was not long before they reached the road of yellow brick and turned again toward the Emerald City where the great Oz dwelt. The road was smooth and well paved, and the country about was beautiful, so that the travellers rejoiced in leaving the forest far behind, and with it the many dangers they had met in its gloomy shades. Once more they could see fences built beside the road, but these were painted green, and when they came to a small house in which a farmer evidently lived, that was also painted green. They passed by several of these houses during the afternoon, and sometimes people came to the doors and looked at them as if they would like to ask questions, but no one came near to them, nor spoke to them, because of the great lion, of which they were very much afraid. These people were all dressed in clothing of a lovely emerald green colour, and wore peaked hats like those of the munchkins. This must be the land of Oz, said Dorothy, and we are surely getting near the Emerald City. Yes, answered the Scarecrow, everything is green here, while in the country the munchkins blue was the favourite colour. But the people do not seem to be as friendly as the munchkins, and I'm afraid we shall be unable to find a place to pass the night. I should like something to eat besides fruit, said the girl, and I'm sure Toto is nearly starved. Let us stop at the next house and talk to the people. So, when they came to a good-sized farmhouse, Dorothy walked boldly up to the door and knocked. A woman opened it just far enough to look out and said, What do you want, child, and why is that great lion with you? We wish to pass the night with you, if you would allow us, answered Dorothy, and the lion is my friend and comrade. He would not hurt you for the world. Is he tame? asked the woman opening the door a little wider. Oh yes, said the girl, and he's a great coward too. He'll be more afraid of you than you are of him. Well, said the woman, after thinking it over and taking another peep at the lion, if that is the case, you may come in and I will give you some supper and a place to sleep. So they all entered the house where there were, besides the woman, two children and a man. The man had hurt his leg and was lying on the couch in a corner. They seemed greatly surprised to see so strange a company, and while the woman was busy laying the table, the man asked, Where are you all going? To the Emerald City, said Dorothy, to see the great Oz. Oh, indeed, exclaimed the man. Are you sure that Oz will see you? Why not, she replied. Why, it is said that he never lets anyone come into his presence. I have been to the Emerald City many times, and it's a beautiful and wonderful place but I have never been permitted to see the great Oz, nor do I know of any living person who has seen him. Does he never go out? asked the Scarecrow. Never. He sits day after day in the great throne room of his palace, and even those who wait upon him do not see him face to face. What's he like? asked the girl. That is hard to tell, said the man thoughtfully. You see, Oz is a great wizard, and can take on any form he wishes so that some say he looks like a bird, and some say he looks like an elephant, and some say he looks like a cat. To others, he appears as a beautiful fairy, or a brownie, or in any other form that pleases him. But who the real Oz is, when he's in his own form, no living person can tell. That's very strange, said Dorothy, but we must try in some way to see him, or we shall have made our journey for nothing. Why do you wish to see the terrible Oz? asked the man. I want him to give me some brains, said the scarecrow. Oh, Oz could do that easily enough, declared the man. He has more brains than he needs. And I want him to give me a heart, said the tin woodman. That will not trouble him, continued the man, for Oz has a large collection of hearts, all shapes and sizes. And I want him to give me courage, said the cowardly lion. Oz keeps a great pot of courage in his throne room, said the man, which he has covered with a golden plate to keep it from running over. He will be glad to give you some. And I want him to send me back to Kansas, said Dorothy. Where is Kansas? asked the man with surprise. I don't know, replied Dorothy sorrowfully, but it's my home, and I'm sure it's somewhere. Very likely. Well, Oz can do anything, so I suppose he will find Kansas for you. But first you must get to see him, and that will be a hard task, for the great wizard does not like to see anyone, and he usually has his own way. But what do you want? 
he continued, speaking to Toto. Toto only wagged his tail, for, strange to say, he could not speak. The woman now called to them that supper was ready, so they gathered around the table and Dorothy ate some delicious porridge and a dish of scrambled eggs and a plate of nice white bread and enjoyed her meal. The lion ate some of the porridge, but did not care for it, saying it was made from oats and oats were food for horses, not for lions. The scarecrow and the tin woodman ate nothing at all. Toto ate a little of everything and was glad to get a good supper again. The woman now gave Dorothy a bed to sleep in and Toto lay down beside her while the lion guarded the door of her room so she might not be disturbed. The scarecrow and the tin woodman stood up in a corner and kept quiet all night, although of course they could not sleep. The next morning, as soon as the sun was up, they started on their way and soon saw a beautiful green glow in the sky just before them. That must be the Emerald City, said Dorothy. As they walked on, the green glow became brighter and brighter. It seemed that at last they were nearing the end of their travels. Yet it was afternoon before they came to the great wall that surrounded the city. It was high and thick and of a bright green colour. In front of them, and at the end of the road of yellow brick, was a big gate, all studded with emeralds that glittered so in the sun that even the painted eyes of the scarecrow were dazzled by their brilliancy. There was a bell beside the gate, and Dorothy pushed the button and heard a silvery tinkle sound within. Then the big gate swung slowly open, and they all passed through and found themselves in a high arched room, the walls of which glistened with countless emeralds. Before them stood a little man about the same size as the munchkins. He was clothed all in green from his head to his feet, and even his skin was of a greenish tint. At his side was a large green box. When he saw Dorothy and her companions, the man asked, What do you wish in the Emerald City? We came here to see the Great Oz, said Dorothy. The man was so surprised at this answer that he sat down to think it over. It has been many years since anyone has asked to see Oz, he said, shaking his head in perplexity. He is powerful and terrible, and if you come on an idle or foolish errand to bother the wise reflections of the great wizard, he might be angry and destroy you all in an instant. But it is not a foolish errand, nor an idle one, replied the scarecrow. It is important, and we have been told that Oz is a good wizard. So he is, said the green man, and he rules the Emerald City wisely and well. But to those people who are not honest or who approach him from curiosity, he is most terrible, and few have ever dared ask to see his face. I am the guardian of the gates, and since you demand to see the great Oz, I must take you to his palace. But first, you must put on the spectacles. Why? asked Dorothy. Because if you did not wear the spectacles, the brightness and glory of the Emerald City would blind you. Even those who live in the city must wear spectacles night and day. They are all locked on, for Oz ordered it so when the city was first built, and I have the only key that will unlock them. He opened the big box, and Dorothy saw that it was filled with spectacles of every size and shape. All of them had green glasses in them. The guardian of the gates found a pair that would just fit Dorothy and put them over her eyes. There were two golden bands fastened to them that passed around the back of her head where they were locked together by a little key that was at the end of a chain the guardian of the gates wore around his neck. When they were on, Dorothy could not take them off had she wished. But of course, she did not wish to be blinded by the glare of the Emerald City, so she said nothing. Then the green man fitted spectacles for the scarecrow and the tin woodman and the lion, and even on little Toto, and all were locked fast with the key. Then the guardian of the gates put on his own glasses and told them he was ready to show them to the palace. Taking a big golden key from a peg on the wall, he opened another gate, and they all followed him through the portal into the streets of the Emerald City. Good night.